Today, I'm going to show you how to use ChatGPT to read philosophy. That's reading philosophy, not writing philosophy. We're all sort of familiar with that great plagiarism engine in the sky that it is. That's not what we're talking about here. I'm talking about reading and encountering ideas for the first time and trying to make some sense of an original philosophical work. So what we're going to do is we're going to dive in and go through an example first and show you how this works. This is what I call the onion tree approach in peeling back the onion and then branching out to different ideas. And the large language models like ChatGPT present us with a unique opportunity to be able to do this really well and really naturally. Then after doing that, we're going to go into the theory a little bit and talk about why this is a natural way for the mind to think. It has to do with layering abstractions, scaffolding concepts upon one another, and then progressively adding detail because the human mind is limited in the amount of detail that it can take at any one time. And so there is an art to being able to present just the right amount of novelty and detail that will make it possible for us to understand things quickly. Let's say you want to read Descartes meditations and make sense of the first meditation and try and figure out what in the world is going on. Well, as soon as you open it up and read the first sentence, you're immediately assaulted with not only a piece of original philosophy and all of its richness and complexity, but you get the allusions to other works, the way in which he's commenting on and building upon other ideas, how it is that that particular part is a reflection of a larger philosophical project, a larger philosophical system, how it's situated in history, and on and on and on. And there are lots and lots of details that it's just not possible to get that on the first reading. And the first encounter with it can be very over. No, it is. It's, it is overwhelming. And in some cases, especially if you're reading somebody like, you know, Hegel, who is notoriously bad for this, it's very overwhelming. It's disorienting and it can be uh, disconcerting and, you know, a, a real motivation killer. So what I recommend instead is using an AI agent like ChatGPT, taking the onion tree approach and peeling back the different layers of the different onions and proceeding down, getting more and more detailed, following the, uh, the trail to different ideas, and finally trying to understand the work. Okay, so let's look at how we should approach using ChatGPT to read philosophy and learn something new. So let's say you're studying Descartes' meditations, number one. So one of the first things that it's helpful to do, I think, is to prime ChatGPT by telling it what kind of expert it is, what kind of background it has, and how to talk to you. So that's both giving it a kind of personality and then telling it how you want to phrase things for you. So you might say something like this. You are a philosophy professor of 30 years who has studied Descartes. I am a, and then fill in the blank, right? You know, what is the level that you want it to, to speak to you at? So you could say, I am a high school student who is seeing this material for the first time. Now, um, you can either go ahead and start with the questions or you can do one better and say, you know, do you understand? Like you can check to see if it understands what's going on. So reply, reply understood if you understand. And it will say, understood. It's like, okay, cool, we're good. It's like nodding along. You know, it has nodded along and said, yes, I understand. We're gonna go forward in, in conversation. Great. Now, summarize Descartes' meditation number one in two sentences. And I like two sentences here because one sentence oftentimes isn't really enough and two is still very bite-sized. And when I say bite-sized, that is not an arbitrary thing. We're going to talk about that when we get into the theory section of this. Bite-sized basically refers to a kind of short-term memory, you know, here's how much we can take in and have present right on the surface of our brain for a few seconds. Any longer than two sentences, if it goes to like, you know, 30 seconds to try and read in something, uh, then it's not quite the same kind of processing. And so this is, I think, really key. So here we go. It's told us that Descartes sets out to doubt all of his beliefs, 
trying to find a foundation for knowledge that can't be doubted. Man, that is perfect. That is exactly the sort of in a nutshell summary that we're looking for here. That's exactly what he's doing. And then it goes on to say, that's what he's doing. Here's what he concludes. Because he's had uh, experiences of being deceived, he can't be certain that anything he believes is true. Terrific. That's exactly what's going on. And now that provides a nice backdrop against which you can zoom in further and say, okay, now what's going on next? So now, tell me more about how he doubted all his beliefs and why he wanted to find a foundation for knowledge that is beyond, oops, beyond doubt. And I like to do it this way. So instead of it giving you this like long extended narrative, I like to say, do this in a list of, let's say 10 bullet points. Now it's going to give you a list in the style that you asked for. And so these are 10 kind of bite-sized ideas in themselves that are one level down. So one additional level of detail that provides you more insight into the detail of what's going on with how it is that he doubted his beliefs beliefs, and why it is that he wanted to find that foundation for knowledge. And so this is perfect. This tells us a lot about what's going on and it does it, I mean, kind of in order, right? It's exactly the sort of thing that you would want if you were talking with somebody and their mind happened to be extremely organized, right? Which of course is not always the case. I mean, you ask your philosophy professor, and I know I'm certainly guilty of this. Um, you ask your philosophy professor a question and sometimes they get really excited about the response and they get distracted and go off and chase squirrels and there's a tangent and, you know, 10 minutes later, you don't even know what it was that you were talking about to begin with. But <laughs> instead, this gives you a perfectly organized response in the way that you asked for. And that's really nice because you can adapt this to whatever your learning style is. But what I'm suggesting here is that everyone has a certain amount of this in common. We all like to take in these bite-sized chunks with just enough novelty that we can build upon what it is that we already know and don't have to relearn. We don't have to apply conscious energy to rethink about the things that we've already learned. Then we can just go forward and say, okay, here's the new little bits. So I knew that Descartes, because of what it told me up above, I know that Descartes is setting out to doubt all of his beliefs. He's trying to build on a foundation of certainty. Great. Now let me take that bit of knowledge and build upon it. And so he says, Descartes recognized that he's accepted many false beliefs in the past. And so he wants to try and extirpate those false beliefs. Extirpating literally means to pull up by the root, right? To get rid of all that stuff. And so he says he's going to establish a method that will give him, you know, certainty that anything that could be doubted has been doubted. And so I don't want to leave any room for doubt. And we go on adding detail with this. So number two, anything that comes from the senses, sometimes those false beliefs are from there. So he's going to doubt the reliability of the senses and so on and so on. And we get further and further with this. And one of the things that I think is very interesting is that you notice, let's see down here in number six, he had to doubt everything. Doubting everything is typically when we talk about Descartes and when we talk about it in class, this is the sort of thing that I would write on the board. We talk about it in terms of hyperbolic doubt. Well, hy hyperbole just means exaggerated, but that's the way that philosophers tend to talk about it. It becomes kind of a technical term, but it's a piece of jargon that isn't really necessary. Like later you're going to encounter that and you're going to want to know what it is, but you don't need it when you first start out. And because I told it to talk to me as though I was a high school student, so someone who is, you know, not a child, but at the same time also probably not terribly familiar with philosophy, philosophical history, and philosophical language. And so I asked it to just put things in simpler terms, man. You know, I mean, make it intelligible for me. And that's a, a real key and a real virtue of one of the things that we can do here. And so we can then take this list, try and, you know, if all of these are, are cogent to us, if all of these make sense, 
then we can drill down further. And we might say, you know, okay, he's been deceived in the past. Well, why does he assume that he's been deceived in the past? Because that is one of the going in assumptions, right? So we now want to kind of drill down further and say, all right, well, I follow it. You said you've been deceived. You have false beliefs. So you want to doubt those. Well, what grounds is that based upon? And uh, what we get here is, oh, well, he had beliefs. They turned out to be false. Well, I mean, we're all familiar with that sort of thing, right? I thought that I saw a, you know, a lake, um, but it turned out to be a, a mirage that was produced by the heat. You know, I thought that I, you know, blah, 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 whatever it might happen to be. Uh, yeah, and it mentions optical illusions. That's great because that's sort of a canonical example. It's very visceral and, you know, in our face. We're all familiar with it. We know that it's false. Uh, and we're aware very quickly that it's false, so it's easy for us to conceptually, you know, parse that and and identify with it. In other words, we we might jump to the most extreme thing and say, "Oh, I hallucinated that a unicorn was running across the yard." Eh, conceptually, yeah, but how many of us have experience with that, right? I mean, that's not the sort of thing that we really see and probably have any experience with. So it's better to begin with things that we, you know, can actually identify with, and and this is this is perfect. So. This is the sort of peeling back the onion that I'm suggesting that we should do here. And so now I might say, okay, I understand what's going on here as an outline in meditation one. Now I want you to further this and prepare me for reading the real thing by summarize meditation one using Descartes own terms basically his language right so his philosophical jargon yeah and so we're starting to get little changes now right so things that are certain indubitable and that's more of a common way of speaking about this that's great because we're doing this kind of yo-yo version. In other words, I, I mentioned this in my uh, tips on writing philosophy papers, writing and revising with an AI agent. One of the things that you can do is use this yo-yo approach where you're going back and forth and iterating. Essentially, it's, it's dialectical in the sense that dialectical simply refers to a kind of back and forth in conversation where you're trying to, you have, you know, tension of different kinds and that tension gets resolved as you're asking questions, working through problems and trying to, to find your way in the conversation. And that's effectively the kind of thing that I'm suggesting here. It's just that most of the time when we're writing papers, we don't have someone sitting beside us the entire time that we can ask questions to at any given time, someone who has an infinite amount of patience for us, and we can ask them the same questions or ask them stupid questions or ask them, you know, whatever it might happen to be. We don't often have that luxury. And even if we are in, let's say, a university writing center and we're getting help on our writing, then... We might have somebody who's going through that with us for a little while, but when we're dealing with another person, oftentimes, and the same kind of thing happens in class, when we're dealing with another person or when we're asking questions in a more public forum in class, we're often reluctant to try and ask questions that will in any way degrade that other person's opinion of us. And so we don't want to ask stupid questions, right? That's the fear in asking a stupid question. I mean, obviously, I wouldn't ask that kind of question if I didn't need it. So I need the answer to it, but I may not really want to ask it because I don't want to look like a fool. We don't have to worry about that with these online agents. And I think people are going to slowly wake up to just how powerful that is, that we can be completely honest and open with them. You can say, look, I don't understand this at all. That doesn't make any sense. And we don't have to worry about, you know, oh, well, I had a conversation with them yesterday and I gave them the, you know, false impression that I really understood this when I don't. We don't have to worry about that with these things. So we can be totally honest and just get down to brass tacks in terms of what it is that we understand, what it is that we don't understand. So you can say, for instance, right here, I don't understand how he concludes that um, his own existence is beyond doubt. Explain that. 
And ChatGPT will go off and create a response that is tailored to that specific gap in your knowledge as insofar as you've been able to express it. And that's part of the art, right? Is being able to express exactly what it is that you don't understand. And here is, this is where I get so excited about this as a philosophy professor, because that is exactly the sort of thing that we should be doing. That is exactly the sort of thing that we should be doing in debate, in conversation, in philosophical writing, and in general, in philosophical thinking. We need to be able to identify exactly what we don't understand. And insofar as we can identify exactly what we don't understand, now we have a tool that we can address exactly what that gap is and try and fill it in with just the right piece. One of the ways of understanding the role of a teacher, what it is that a teacher should be doing in a philosophy setting, and how someone should be, I mean, realistically, this is learning anything. One of the things that a teacher should be doing is trying to tailor and create an individualized experience with respect to giving you exactly the piece of information, exactly the kind of rhetoric that you need to advance your understanding. That could be a piece of information that you're missing or simply providing a new direction for thinking and saying, look, you know, let me point you in this direction. Now go forward in that direction and think about this. And oftentimes, that is where things are the most useful in teaching, and we have a unique opportunity, I think, with these AI agents to be able to do just that. Okay, let's talk about the theory. Let's talk about why philosophy is hard so that we can better understand the problem that we're trying to solve. Philosophy is overwhelming in the way that a drama is. It's an attempt to recreate a fully saturated, rich experience of thought. A good philosophical work is like a haiku. Haikus are nuggets of experience described in a way that draws out that experience in the reader. For philosophy to do this, it must transport you into the imaginative horizon of the original thinker. This means getting in their head by making all the connections and associations while filling you with the author's raw materials for conceptual reasoning, so the ideas, the facts, and everything. This is why philosophy is overwhelming. It's a Herculean task to get into someone else's head. Now, that's the summit. The next step down from that is a descriptive, conceptual summary of their work. Summary books written by other philosophers are easier to read than the original because in the summary books, every word isn't necessarily chosen as carefully. The allusions are explained rather than presented. And everything is translated insofar as it can be into conceptual reasoning. This can never be as good as the original, but it'll be a lot easier to understand. Now, going down an additional level, the next level down from that is to use common concepts for the summary instead of technical terms and language loaded with that particular philosopher's system and history. So we're getting simpler and simpler in terms of first we distilled it into concepts, now we've taken away some of the difficult language and concepts. Beyond that, the summary can be made shorter by pruning away even more detail. This is like taking an image progressively more and more out of focus. And by pruning away detail, we're abstracting. We're getting rid of things that are not necessary to see the whole picture. And because of that, we're losing some of that richness, but it makes it easier to understand. Finally, at the furthest remove from the original, we have the very short and simple, I suggested two sentence version of the work. This will ignore all but the most significant of ideas and describe them in what may even be a reductively simplistic but understandable way. Okay, let's talk a little bit about how the mind understands ideas. And I don't want to get lost in a neuroscience rabbit hole here, so we're going to talk about the bits that are the most important for understanding a new piece of philosophy, understanding a new idea, gaining that insight, having that aha moment where now it clicks and it works, and then going from there. So 
what does it look like to think about that? When we normally think about trying to solve a puzzle, trying to understand something, we're talking about conscious awareness. So the light of consciousness is shining upon just the data that we're trying to get there from the original philosophical work. And the way that this works is that we can only tolerate so much at a given time. So we can only tolerate so much information coming on at a given time. And this has to do not only with the complexity of information that we can deal with, but also limitations with respect to memory and so on. And the way this works is that consciousness, this awareness, stands on the foundation of habituated ideas. And so that may be kind of a, a weird term. You may have never heard this before, habituated ideas. So we oftentimes think about habit in terms of like muscle memory and things that we practice several times, we get down and then we don't have to think about them anymore and we can now ride a bicycle without having to worry about where our feet are all the time. That's exactly the same sort of thing that happens with concepts, except that with concepts, what happens is we understand them and when we understand them, we no longer need to think about them. They become as habits in the mind and we no longer have to put conscious energy against trying to understand them. In other words, when you're using a habituated idea, you don't have to rethink it. You don't have to re-understand it. You can just use it. And so that's what I mean here by standing on a foundation of habituated ideas. So when you're consciously thinking about something, you're having to apply energy to understand that thing. But to understand that thing, you're making use of concepts that you don't have to think about. And that's absolutely crucial because otherwise our thought would really never get off the ground. And the whole scaffolding thing that I've been talking about just would fall apart. It wouldn't work at all. So that's the basic premise is that we have habituated ideas. We're trying to create new ones via new understanding. And that happens when we try to read a work of philosophy. This is why it's overwhelming, because we can only take so much at once. If we don't have enough of it habituated and understood, then it's overwhelming. Okay, now, our conscious awareness can only handle a little bit of novelty. And not only can it handle only a little bit of novelty, but the way that we receive it, in other words, the way we actually feel about it, is something that is, is very strange and interesting. And so I want to show you something called the Wundt Curve. And so this is named after Wilhelm Wundt, who was a psychologist from, I mean, this is, you know, 100 plus years ago. He studied uh, emotional arousal in the face of novelty. And this curve, which is, I mean, this is not so much an empirical thing that you're going to put numbers to so much as it is being able to understand how things change in the presence of increasing novelty. And essentially what you see here is that, you know, if things are very well habituated and you're not encountering anything new, you don't really have to think about it. There's no arousal there. You're not excited to any kind of conscious awareness. The mind doesn't really have to do much of anything. You can just use the objects. These are things that are absolutely ready to hand and you can, can do whatever you want with them. You walk into your average classroom. You don't have to think about how to use the door. You don't have to think about how to use the chair or how to use a table or any of those sorts of things. All the walls and the trappings and the lights and all of that is very, very well known and very familiar. You don't have to think about any of it. In other words, the room becomes transparent to the experience, which means you can focus on presumably the elements of novelty that are going to be present in the the lecture and the discussion. And so as we proceed further on the curve, novelty at first is exciting. It's something that's curiosity inspiring and interesting. And when we say interesting, and I, I now have curiosity about this thing, part of what we mean is that we are positively charged with respect to being motivated to go pursue it and to try and understand it. And so we become excited. We enjoy a little bit of novelty. But there's a point beyond which that excitement caps out and it no longer is exciting to get more novelty. It, start, it starts to become kind of overwhelming and can even be fear provoking, depending upon what kind of novelty it is, depending upon what situation we're in. And so that arousal goes down and instead of being positively charged, it can actually cross all the way down and become quite negatively charged. In other words, it becomes very uncomfortable for us to experience a high degree of novelty. And so 
that is key to understanding why it is that a lot of people don't like reading philosophy and don't like reading original works in philosophy. And people describe reading Hegel, for instance, as painful. I love Hegel, but the, the writing can be very, very difficult. And so that's the reason why the writing is so difficult, because there is so much novelty, because there is so much that isn't understood, and that can be overwhelming and produce a distinctly negative feeling. So I hope this helps. I hope you found it interesting. I hope you found it insightful and helpful. I hope ultimately that you found this good to think with. See you next time.